two, one. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is Nicholas Vince. You're chatter I'm chattering with Mark Logan. Good evening, Mark. Good evening. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed for joining me. I've been looking forward to having this chat because we got together about a month or so ago now to have an yeah. initial chat about something um, based on something that you put up on Facebook, actually. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is a really interesting topic. We will get to that in a few moments. I'm just going to do a quick shout out to Kelly Rawn. And that is to say thank you very much to Kelly for my lovely T-shirt that is based on the name of my second volume of short stories, Other People's Darkness. Other people's darkness makes me smile, <laughs> which I thought was very kind of her. And she sent that to me all the way from the good old US of me, so thank you. And I've got a, she sent me another T-shirt as well, which I shall wear next week. Um, it's always nice to be able to get your costume and wardrobe sorted out a week in advance. Um, so before I get into um, uh, chatting with you, and funnily enough, somebody's just popped up on my screen, um, but I'm going to ignore that and just say that there is a change to the schedule. Next week, I was going to be interviewing Sean Evans uh, from Back to the Mo Movies website. Uh, Sean's actually going to be filming next week uh, on, funnily enough, a project I'm also involved in, a film called Volcano. So Sean's going to be away from home. So we next week, we are going to do the original versus remake for Evil Dead. So look out your copies of the original versus remake of Evil Dead. Do come join me next weekend. We'll have another chat. We had a good, some good times when we were talking about Fright Night and um, The Fly. So I'm really looking forward to that one. So Sean is now going to appear on the 7th of June and we'll be talking about uh, Back to the Movies. We'll also be talking about Night Terrors, a new app which uh, Sean is involved with on Indiegogo at the moment. Uh, this is a fascinating kind of virtual reality where you can get your phone and use your house, but ghosts are going to appear once you've got the phone. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing that one, to get, making sure that it's all uh, funded and so on. I think it's a very exciting thing. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to be involved in a, uh, a, a short film called Volcano, directed by Mike Clark. I'll put in a link to the Facebook page on this and go and check that out, please. Um, the other people who are going to be coming on on May the 24th are Damon Rickard and Alex Matheson, writer and director of the tour, which stars Jessica Cameron. Jessica mentioned it last week, and if you were watching last week's show, you, uh, Damon came and joined us. Delighted to say that uh, Alex and uh, Damon will be joining us. And I'm arranging uh, probably a special extended uh, we don't want to shape the entire film, possibly, but basically the tour is in festivals at the moment, so I'm just negotiating how much of the tour we can show you guys before we actually go to the uh, the Hangout on Air. But I'm really interested about talking to these two because unlike the Soskers, they're not identical twin sisters, um, but they're both writers and directors of the tour. So I was interested to know how that uh, worked. So to find out more about that, so please subscribe to the channel and you'll get notifications as to when the next shows are coming on. But um, you wanted to talk a little bit about something we're going to come across later on, and that is solitary. Um, yeah, solitary. Um, yeah, it's my my first, I, I call it my first proper short. Um, I'd done a couple of two or three minute shorts that were, that were fun, but ultimately they were very dialogue sparse. Um, and I was going to be right, um, my first project was going to be uh, based on my own short, um, film script, but then somebody else at Raindance, which is where I'm studying at the minute, came up and said, I like what you did on this three minute short, 48 hour contest short. Um, can you have a look at this? And I really, I really like the script. There were some issues with it, but as a, as a piece, it was a bit Roman Polanski um, repulsion meets early Cronenberg. It had this right. body horror um, thing going on that it just, it just spoke to me, and it's interesting because I'm very interested in kind of ghosts and supernatural type of side of things. That's what scares the hell out of me. Um, right. and that's kind of all the stuff I was writing was all kind of ghosts, haunted houses, um, spirits of some description, demons. And then Solitary was very different. It was, it was all fa fairly internalized, and it was mostly one actor in a room, and she deteriorates, and the room deteriorates around her. And then her life is kind of told very quickly in flashback. 
Um, okay, all right. Well, don't give us too much, or we will come no, to that. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about um, But uh, there will be a link. We'll make If you give me a link to uh, the Facebook page um, yeah. for Solitary, we'll make sure that that's up um, as well. And whilst you were talking, I was just checking that, uh, yes, we're going to be sorting out a um, an excerpt from uh, the tour. Uh, so that people can watch before Damon and Alex come and join us as well. That was the email that flashed up just as I was speaking. <laughs> uh, I do cool. love the tour. It was fun. Yeah, no, the tour was a really good movie. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed it as well. So one of the reasons. So before um, we delve into something I wanted to really talk to you about, which is something you mentioned, Grain Dance, and talking about film distribution, financing, and independent distribution. I wanted to. Talk a little bit about your background and how you got into this, and because, like myself, you're doing independent filmmaking, not in not in the first flush of youth, let us say. No. Um, <laughs> but you've done some interesting, and you had done a tour of Clive Barker's History of the Devil. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, back in ninety five, ninety six, around when the National Lottery started, they did this arts for everyone. Um, grant and they were basically giving away five up to five thousand pounds to virtually anybody. If you came along and, and said, I, I want to open a kind of an artistic, oh, oh, we seem to have got boss a problem with um, Mark's feed there. Let me just see if I can. Then Mark seems to have a problem mid mid flow. Hopefully he's going to be coming back in a few moments. I'll just carry on talking. Hopefully whilst he realizes that we can't actually see him or hear him at the moment. Um, oh, never had that happened to me before. So we seem to be okay at my end. Can you just do me a favor, guys? Can you just tell me if you're still if you're watching this? Can you just put up an activity just to say whether or not you can see me? I'm assuming you can see me, but Mark appears to have frozen. Um, ooh, so we may have to wait for a little, few moments whilst Mark comes back. Maybe have been watching you on TV. Uh, okay, so Damon's there. Um, <laughs> right, okay, so what I'm going to do whilst we talk to Mark, or we wait for Mark to come on, I'm going to see... Yep. I'm assuming everyone else can still see me. So I'm going to, Damon, if you're, I think Damon, you are there. Um, I'm gonna get on, but I think if I invite Annette last week, I'm going to see if, oh, I've lost. So Mark, I'm gonna invite Mark back again. We seem to have lost Mark, so I'm gonna hope that I can get Mark back in again. In the meantime, I'm gonna try and get, it's so much fun. I love it when technology. Uh, I can see you, Nick. Thank you very much indeed. Cool. Damon, just so you can see me, I've just invited Mark back. And Damon, I've just invited you via Annette. But let me just check. This is so much fun. I do apologize, folks. Um, yeah, see you, Mark Froze. That's what I thought. And let me just see if I can see what happened to Mark. He seems to have had a Wi-Fi issue and one of these technology things. So I'm going to carry on for a little while, and let's just see if we can get Mark. What I might do is I I can't actually see exactly who's else is coming on and watching at the moment, but I'm going to send out a general invite to anybody I know who knew who was actually going to be here before. And see if I can get, there's a whole load of you, so I shall bring you on now whilst we wait for Mark to come back on. Ding, ding, ding. So there's a whole load of invitations just gone out. So bear with us, folks. We're hoping to get Mark back on at some point. Um, let's see if I can actually get hold of Mark via the same time. Hi, Mark, are you there? Sorry, this is the most interesting. Yeah, 
Okay. Oh, there's Damon. <laughs> Hold up, we're having difficulty hearing you. I think we can hear a TV or something in the background that just said that's exactly what my father said. Hold on. You may have a YouTube playing in the background. I did have a YouTube playing in the background, yes. <laughs> Damon, hi. Hi. Hi, folks. This is Damon Rickard, who's going to be coming on on the 24th of um, May uh, to talk about um, the tour with Alex Matheson. Um, but thank you very much indeed for joining me in the meantime. And as I say, I have posted uh, some uh, invitations to other people whilst we're waiting for Mark. And I'm going to keep on trying. Um, yep. Yeah, okay. Kelly can't join us. She sends her apologies. Um, Hello, Damon. Hello, Nicholas. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, actually, considering. considering <laughs> I lost my, you know, um, I wasn't expecting to talk to you, but I'll quite happily talk to you. Um, so we uh, let's just kind of explain to the folks what we're hoping to achieve on the 24th of May. Okay. Um, you worked with Alex. Now, am I getting the surname correct? Matheson or Matheson? That's, yeah, that's correct, yes. Matheson. Okay, cool. Um, yes. yeah. And you work together on the tour. And yep. you're both credited as writer and director, or are you both director? Uh, both as writer director. Both as writer director. And as I was saying earlier on when I was talking to Mark, you're neither of you the Soska sisters. Um, so this is what I hope to explore. We won't go into that now. But Sorry, we, did you say we're not the Soska sisters? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't anybody tell me this? Oh, dear. <laughs> My career is going to take a whole new trajectory now. <laughs> um, but we're hoping to be able to get uh, an excerpt of the t uh, an extended excerpt from the tour. Yes, that's correct. I'll be uh, I'll be putting that together for you tomorrow. So. Brilliant. So uh, this will give a chance. To be, we didn't want to give the whole game away, particularly as it's going to festivals at the moment. Yeah. Um, so we'll but we, if, this will be more than a trailer. It is an ex uh, extended uh, cut. Yeah. What I'll do is I'll put a little bit from the beginning, from the middle, and a little bit in the house as well in there, yeah. so that it, you can get with the film. You can get an idea of what's going on there. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely. And as I mentioned, who's your who who who's starring in the tour? Um, we've got we've got uh, somebody that probably who watches this have never heard of uh, Jessica Cameron. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's she's in it. We've got Heather Dorf, um, who was in Truth or Dare with Jessica, um, and uh, a guy called Tom Gordon, who we sort of plucked out of out of nowhere, kind of. Right. Um, but he did a he did a fantastic job. Yeah, I've, I've I've had the great pleasure of watching it, and it, it it is a very good job. And there's a there's a real nice vibe going on between your three lead actors. Um, yes, well, we uh, the night before we we shot it, um, we or a couple nights before we took we took the girls out with Tom just so they could uh, build a little bit of chemistry. And uh, so Heather was quite smitten with him. <laughs> <laughs> That always helps. That it always does. helps when you, uh, when, when you do that. Um, okay. Now, as I say, I don't really want to go into this in too, in too much detail um, because we're going to cover this in a lot more detail yeah. on May 24th when I'm talking to Alex. But you're also work you've also been working on something else j just recently. Let's t tell me a little bit about about that. Um, I've, I just recently shot a short called The Package, uh, which <laughs> we brought Tom back for, and we got um, Dan Palmer. Um, involved in it um, and it's uh, sort of it's a very different film to the tour um, it's, uh, it's a lot more stripped back it's one location it's two guys um, and it's a situation where we join them in the, it's two people which are supposed to be quite close we join them in this situation where one of them's done something which uh, has caused um, a massive <sighs> almost like a desperation for the other one. And it's it sort of builds up on the on the characters to how far the other one will, will go to try and resolve this situation. It's uh it's sort of slowly the tension ramps through the through the short. Uh it's in post production at the moment currently being edited. And when do you hope to have that finished? Uh we well we need it finished for first of July because we're gonna enter it into Fright Fest. Okay. 
So fingers crossed we'll – so, yeah, I mean, we're ho- I'm hoping mid-June we'll, we'll have it ready. Right, right. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm just uh, – uh, Andy Stewart says, Damon Ricard, I will be watching on the 24th. Yay! Um, <laughs> Good on <old> Andy. <laughs> I was right. I, I'm glad you said on the 24th, otherwise I, was, I felt he was going to start stalking me again. <laughs> <laughs> now then, I'm hoping that, ah, right. Ah, Hello, Mark. Mark. <laughs> get rid of me and let's get back to the important person. Cheers, Damon. <laughs> Hi, Mark. <laughs> Would you, do you want to just sit there quietly just in case he decides to bugger off and leave? <laughs> okay, okay. I, I will be very, very quiet. <laughs> I, I, oh, sorry, technical difficulties. I have to clear my cache of cookies and that. Uh, I, you've been in the cookie jar and just too many cookies. This is the this is the yeah. real problem. Oh, <laughs> you, anyone who knows me knows that's true. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. So, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. For, yeah. Well done, mate. I. Yeah, that must have been quite panicky for you. We were doing fine uh, whilst you were away. I know, what, it was just a diamond. It was far more interesting than this. <laughs> <laughs> what, what we were talking about is you said you got some money together and you, the, the play you chose was one of Clive Barker's. Uh, yes. it'd be quick. Just give me a very quick precy of the play that you chose and uh, the name. We did History of the Devil, um, which is, I, I think, one of the potentially easiest. It's it's a journey story. De- the devil gets thrown out of heaven. He doesn't remember initially who he is and then meets a number of different people, has a diff- number of different encounters along his journey uh, and then rediscovers himself and decides that actually being the devil isn't that bad. Right. Okay. That's right. I'm just going to hide... Yes. Still, although, uh, sorry, although Damon's muted, I was still getting some some TV background noise as well whilst we were talking through that. Okay, so this the history of the devil. I've read that play. I remember. I was very fortunate. I, I never got to see History of the Devil. I got to see Frankenstein in Love and Secret Life of Cartoons wow. performed by the Dog Company. Um, but I remember sitting down. Um, I've read known Clive for about a year or so, just going around to his place and saying, right, give me the plays. I've never seen the plays. I want to see all the scripts. So I got given these beautiful typewritten scripts in those days. Um, and just going, wow, this is amazing. This is amazing. So you, how long was the tour that you did with History of the Devil? We toured it over about, it was about four weeks, just something like that. Um, and it, it, w- it was already selling pretty well, and on, just really on the back of Clive's name, really. Um, it, it, it was back in, like I say, around 95-ish, um, and, and Clive was, well, still is huge, but, you know, he, it seemed to be the zeitgeist, and we were getting a lot of people through the door who never went to the theatre. That was the feedback they were giving us. We were getting a lot of people who were interested in alternative culture, a lot of horror fans who maybe traditionally went to movies rather than theatre. Um, so that was great. Um we had some issues around Burton on Trent. Uh, <laughs> Tell me about Burton on Trent. Burton on Trent. Um, Burton on Trent banned us. Um, specifically, they banned me, uh, and they definitely banned History of the Devil from appearing. Um, at the time, and I, I don't know about now after what happened like this week, um, it, it was a very conservative, conservative local government. Right. Uh, and it was a it was a government building, the theatre there. It was like a government run art centre, local government. Um, and they they had somebody somewhere had clearly not read it, but had kind of almost like preceded it. And they said, "Devil comes down to earth, meets a woman and, and her daughter, adult daughter, rapes her or has sex with her." And they just went, "Well, it's got it's got paedophilia in. Oh, it's got rape in." Oh, it's got it's got people being burnt and pillaged and, and making terrible moral judgments, and they banned us because they found us to be completely morally reprehensible. Wow! But why did they ban you particularly? As well, apart from because that's the play. But why well, did you? I, I attempted to justify um, what was going on in the play, and every time I attempted to justify it, the papers, as they are wont to do, intend to. To sell more papers, they want a big story, and I'm afraid, you know, Burton on Trent Herald or whatever it was, and 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 the Tamworth Gazette 
all these local papers didn't have a story and so suddenly to focus on this person who was doing these reprehensible acts and and this director was in control and he was he was going to bring a naked Asian man would you how could you possibly have this in Burton on trend on our stage is going to be rolling around naked and fornicating with minors is what they took the play to be <laughs> <laughs> I've read, it's, it's many years since I've read the history of the devil hmm. I don't remember a naked Asian man in there to begin with did you well, have a naked Asian man when the when the devils we, we happen to have an Asian actor who played the devil and that's what we have and so when he's when he's thrown out of um, heaven initially he comes down naked which right. is fine and I didn't think it was an issue but of course every time the papers wanted to know well what happens in the play and you were going well this is what happened. no what exactly happens and you were going well okay the devil thrown out of is he clothed and you're thinking that's an odd question is the devil clothed well no he's, he's in heaven so he's, he's naked as God would intend so this naked man appears on the stage yes and he's played by an Asian and you're just going yes uh, this guy's an actor he's a very good actor he's playing the part and yes they kind of it was just on no level did they want that play anywhere near and so as a result of that the rest of the tour sold out right (laughs) (laughs) there really is no such thing as bad publicity in other words yeah yeah Yeah, that that, 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 an interesting experience (laughs) yes yeah no absolutely Um, yeah absolutely I, I yeah, and of course this is, you know, just to remind folks, of course, this is in the days before the internet, so this is all local papers, so this is, you were actually physically talking to reporters, giving yeah. interviews, and then they were going away and saying, yeah, no, this is this yeah. is what's actually happening. I, I, wish, I, could get, I wish I could get any, anything close to that amount of coverage as a filmmaker, but it was all front pages at the time, it was, oh my god, you've got to see this play. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so this is so you had a, a, a bit of a history in theatre and so on. Yeah. Um, and jumping forward a few years, um, you moved away from theatre. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I was an actor originally. I trained as an actor, um, and on my and <laughs> our graduation shows, all of the feedback I received from everybody, which was a bit gutting, was come back in twenty or thirty years' time. And you'll probably get work as a character actor, but you'll never get work. This was pre-James Corden. So (laughs) there was no such thing as an overweight young male in his 20s that was going to get anything like any leading parts. And they went, you won't get it. You need a more lived-in look. And I've I've gone gone past that point. I should be going back to the acting world because I've certainly got a lived-in look. Okay, so you went on, um, and one of the things that you've taken up, how you've, you're involved in Real Real Scares, um, yeah. which is a blog, uh, which I kind of find interesting. And your, your your USP, your unique selling point on that is the fact that basically it's four of you, and you all review the same movie. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. That the, the ideal is that all four of us. Occasionally, if one of us doesn't go to a festival, then it's sometimes three. But the idea is that it's all four will review the same film. And as you say, the unique selling point was always, if you normally read any review, it's it, it's obviously subjective. And so we yeah. thought, well, if there are four of us um, who, who are just friends, and all it is is the four of us always sat together for the last several years at Fright Fest. That's how we got to know each other. We didn't have a prior history or anything. And, and we just struck on, we really got on, and we just came up with this idea, and we'd been mulling it over for the last couple of years, and then at last year's Fright Fest, um, that was that was the moment, it was like, yeah, this isn't the time, let's try it and see, and it seems to, because then if you get one person who really doesn't like something for their own personal reasons, it doesn't affect normally the overall score, um, but it, it, it's interesting, I find it interesting to read the others, to see what the other guys think of stuff, because we all have, we all come at it from a different perspective. So, I touch wood, it seems to be, it seems to be um, received pretty well. So, who are your who are your colleagues on Real Real Scares? Ah, ah. Well, we have um, Mike Shawcross, uh, who's also, uh, well, my my photographer in residence, and Damon's now as well. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and he's now taking photos of just about every film set in the UK, it would seem. Um, and then you've got uh, John, um, who does all the design on my posters. It seems like everyone's kind of together making movies. But um, And then we have a ninja. Uh, and the ninja is, is a guy called Chris, who no one ever sees in between Fright Fests. But he is out there. And we hear nothing from him for ages, and suddenly he'll give us like ten reviews, and then disappear into the night. So Ninja Chris could be watching now, and we'll never know. <laughs> and we'll never know, unless he decides to message us or something, or give us give us a review, basically. <laughs> yeah. So you've you've been running this for about a year or so. Uh, it, uh, since last Fright Fest, so only about seven or eight months. Yeah, about seven or eight, because I was looking at some of the stuff, and it, it, and it is absolutely fascinating, because, as you say, you get more than one person, and you don't always agree. No, um, no, we we, I, I, we all commit from different points of view. I mean, if, if we were doing retro stuff, I'd look at Dario Argento, and I'd be waxing lyrical about um, Argento and Giallo, well, from the 70s anyway. Uh, and then I can tell you that there are other people who would who would literally crucify me for doing so. <laughs> So we won't be doing any Dario films because he will get an awful score. Uh, not right. Me, but he will get an awful score. <laughs> so yeah, we all have different lines. But, but the good thing is, if four people give it a great review or four people give it a one-star review, you can be fairly sure as, as, as you know, someone who's thinking about watching that film that that film's going to be great or that film's going to be dire. Because right. if four people with very different likes and dislikes all go, we love this. Um, the House right. at the End of Time, which we did a couple of weeks ago, gets five out of five, and that's the first film we've ever kind of given that to. Really? So, it's it, it w when it works, it's great, I think. But oh, interesting. <laughs> okay. And just so that everyone knows, this is Real Real Scares, and it's spelt R-E-A-L. Yes. R-E-E-L. Yes. Scares. <laughs> yes. So, Real Real Scares. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, which, yeah, I, I find absolutely fascinating. Um, so, sorry, I'm just hesitating for a few moments because I've just managed to open up a um, an app that I really didn't mean to open up on my, <laughs> on my laptop. Go ahead, it's your show. You're <laughs> no, no, really an app. <laughs> As, as everyone knows who watches this, this, this show is of the highest technical and professional standard at all times. Which I've only added to tonight, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So you, you've done this, and basically your, your, your love of, hit, of horror, obviously, it goes back a long time. Um, yeah, and yeah. You, you mentioned, you, you alluded to the fact, how long have you been going to Fright Fest in London? Uh, my first Fright Fest was, it was the last one at the Prince Charles um, before they moved. It was um, with Hellboy, so it would be about 2004, I okay. think, around there, was my first one. I had a couple of years off then, and then I came back in sort of the later 90s, and um, or later 10s. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think I've done about nine, nine or, yeah, nine now, I think. So... I do. I do love my August bank holidays. <laughs> <laughs> I was there a couple of years ago when they were doing a screening of Nightbreed, but I wasn't able to make it last year. It it, it doesn't matter. Whenever I want to do something, I'm always usually on the other side of the world. Um, I'm trying to work out the rhythm of that kind of thing. But so from this love of horror and watching this, you decided you wanted to make movies, and then I think you did something very sensible. You decided to train, so you went to rain dance. So what is it you? Being well, I mean, it, it, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. W whenever anyone says, "Oh, you're training to be a filmmaker," I said, "I wish I was," but I'm really, <laughs> I'm doing what everyone else is doing and kind of making it up as they go along. Um, the Rain Dance MA, I, I, I thought was interesting. I mean, I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was a kid. I wanted to be a filmmaker, but but you couldn't, a working class kid couldn't really, there didn't seem to be any way to get the money together to film on 16 mil or 8 mil even. It, it seemed too big a leap. And I think the whole DSLR and digital has kind of opened up and democratised filmmaking, which is now why we have so much product out there. Yeah. Which leads to the, some of the issues for distribution that there are. Um, 
But with the rain dancing, I was made redundant last year after working on the railway for 16 years. Um, and I just thought this is my opportunity. I can either just kind of go straight into another job and put some money on a house, sensible, or I can go off and, and do a rain dance course in independent film, uh, less sensible. Uh, so guess what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but the but the course is in. It's an MA, um, and I'm not. Now I'm kind of thinking, yes, it'd be nice to have an MA at the end of my name because I never did formal education. I was one of those kids that mucked about in class. But actually, it's not formal. There's no there's no real classes as such. There are in the first term, but after that, you go off and you you research your own projects. You, you base your projects around your filmmaking activities. So basically, I'll, I'll decide, my last one was based around solitary, and it was a whole taking a film from script through to production, post-production, and, and this is what I learned, and this is what I'll apply for my next um, film. But th there's, there's, it's, there's a lot of support from mentors. One of my mentors um, used to produce Ken Loach's features um, back in the 90s. Wow. Um, so you get you get a lot of working professionals who are the mentors and who are the tutors, and that's great, and they can put you in contact with people to a degree. But actually, what you're encouraged to do is go out and make film. It's right. very kind of hands-on. But you, they don't say this week you're going to make a music video. This week you're going it, to. It's not kind of a structured class, which is good. I think I'm a bit long in the tooth for that. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's it's great. I mean, I've loved it. Um, but really, all it is, it kind of is almost the thing that gives me an impetus to go, right, I'm going to go out and make a film. Uh, you right. know, now I'm doing this. I've taken this amount of time out of the workplace. I'm going to make films. Um, yeah, so you don't have what you can do anything you want. Some people never make a film on the course, and some people make lots of webisodes, and some people just make one feature or one short. And, and I'm seen as a bit of a, a, a wild card. I'm seen as the nutter who's trying to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> because you want to make a film. I, I, I want to make a number of films, I think. Um, in a very short period of time, I think that's the thing that makes people go, okay. So, um, yeah, it, Rain yeah. Nuts is great fun, but it's not... And so when people say, are oh, you a student? I go, well, actually, now, now I've made one, uh, I'd say I'm a filmmaker, who happens right. to also be studying at Rain Dance, But uh, Okay. And how long is the course? Uh, I started off by doing a one-year full-time. Unfortunately, my MA final project, um, my master's, it was uh, Do Not Disturb, my feature film script. Um, and the idea of actually doing two shorts and a feature film in a year, I thought would be a doddle. A doddle, Nicholas. I thought, how hard is this be? Two shorts and a feature. I'll knock those out in time for dinner. And um, as you'll know, that isn't quite how things work. <laughs> Mm, mm. So I've, I've transferred onto the part time, which gives me. I, I've basically got to um, do the pre production, production, post production, and then look at actually going out and trying to monetize the final feature film by September next year. So I've right. got kind of a year and a half just under um, for the rest of the course. But yeah, but it's kind of flexible on when I deliver the different things, but I have to deliver the finished Do Not Disturb feature by September next year. But actually, it's August next year, really, well, before that, because I want it at Fright Fest next year, but don't we all? Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and when you say French, this is not just the script, this is actually the feature film that you need this to deliver together by film. August of 2016. 2016. That, that, that is when I would be looking at premiering. Initially, it was 2015, but that was just absolutely ridiculous. Right. So, um, yeah. but, but I do think that... Here's the thing. I've, I've met a lot of people already in the film industry in the last year, and you go to meet and greets and parties and after shows and stuff, and it's great for networking, but you meet an awful lot of people who, when you're saying, oh, I've just made this short film, I'm doing another short film, and, and they say, oh, I'm a filmmaker, and you say, oh, what are you doing? Oh, I've been working on my script for the last five years. Well, what have you made in the last five years? Nothing. And I'm like, oh, that will terrify me. I just go, well, I might become one of those people that go, I've got this script. And people are going to go, but you haven't made it. <laughs> so I, I think there's there's an element of sometimes you have to bite the bullet and go out and make something. Right. You, know, you have to, to make traction. 
and and you know when I when I looked at people, I was really inspired by people like Damon, um, right. uh, people like Liam, uh, Regan, Damon, lots of uh, other people, Andy Stewart, people from Fright Fest and people from kind of the horror scene in the UK that that just went out there and started making stuff, you know, right. and, and actually that's that's what I want to do. That's what I did in the theatre with stuff like the Clive play. It was always going, yeah, I want to do this. Let's go out and make it because I think you can, you can overthink it. It's not that you don't do your prep. You have to do preparation. You have to have a good script, but you ultimately need to go. We're going to make this, and you have to put a line in the sand because otherwise, I do feel you become one of those people that go, I'll make something next year, and I don't want to be that Luke Skywalker that didn't go. You know, I don't want to be there going, I'm, I'm now 68 years old. I should have gone when I was still <laughs> Cool. And, it, and I am going to bring Damon, if, if Damon's still, I think Damon's still, he's there in the background. Damon, give me about 10 minutes or so. I'm going to be talking. And if Andy Stewart's still around, I'll, I'll invite Andy on as well um, uh, to come and join us. And because I'd like to come back to some of these topics. The one thing, I, when we were talking earlier on, then, was a, you've done some sort of study, you've investigated independent film distribution as part of your course, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had to do a research project, which was a great deal of fun. Um, and, and so I did my 110,000 words, I think it ended up being in the end. Um, so that's, I went, a no, that's a novel, 110,000 <laughs> words. That's a novel. <laughs> you've written a novel. It, w it wasn't far off. I do have a tendency to overwrite. I do need an editor. Um, right. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, and I wanted to look, for me, again, it's about if you're going to make a film, you're going to put the time and effort into making it. Certainly this was about the feature and the eventual feature. How do you optimise your chance of being able to monetize that film? Because right. whether I take out a loan or put it on a credit card or whether or not I, even if I crowdfund, there's still an expectation to some degree you're going to make enough money either to pay back your investors or to pay off your debt or to be able to actually invest in your next project. You know, and, and one of the things that terrified me when I saw it as a statistic is that um, feature film um, directors, 80% of the people who make a first feature never go on to make another one. Interesting. And that, that was kind of a, a rude awakening moment. Um, and again, when I was interviewing people for um, my research project, I, uh, more, more than a couple of people said to me, you have to be careful on the second film more than the first film. On the first film, you will use a huge amount of favours up. You know, you won't have enough money, if any. Can you do this for free? Can you act in it for free? Will you take deferred payments? You know, will you be able to do effects at cost? You'll, you'll use an awful lot of goodwill. But on your second film, those people will probably go, well, I need to still put a roof over my head. I still need to put food on the table. Yes, I've helped you out, but there is a kind of an expectation as you move through your career that you'll be able to pay people. And I think that's everyone's aspiration. We all, I mean, I want to pay everyone who works on a film. But getting to that point is getting more and more difficult because raising that amount of money is becoming more and more difficult. I, I, that's my view. Having looked at it, uh, there's a, that's very interesting. And so you you said uh, eighty percent of directors. Do you mean specifically independent directors? The, yeah, the, uh, yeah, well, eighty percent. The 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 figure was specifically um, from memory that was taken from uh, the BFI yearbook. I think that was where where that was from last year. That sounds familiar, actually. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And um, and let's face it, most people are going to start as an independent. Yeah, because I mean, nobody who actually just walks into a studio and says, "Right, give me a million dollars, and I'm just going to make it." Oh, um, team million dollars it is these days. Um, even, make... even Christopher Nolan has to go and make following first. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So eighty percent, you know, that, and you think that is just because it's exhausting. I think it's exhausting, and I think, uh, and certainly the feedback I was getting from people when I was asking their opinion on why they thought that was, it was a lot to do with you use up favours, and, and also the perception. If you make a first film and it ends up on the shelves in HMV or Sainsbury's or anywhere else, there is a perception, normally wrongly, oh, you must be making money. And therefore, there's this kind of, when you first go and you say, look, cap in hand, 
but I'm putting all the money I've got into this. You know, I've gone out and maybe got one or two investors. Maybe I've crowdfunded. Maybe it's a, a selection of these different things to make the film on a wing and a prayer. People will help out. But when people see that you've got your film on the shelf, or people find out that you're number five in the charts or ten in the charts, there is an assumption you must be making money. And actually, anyone who's I know some people have had this issue with people who have had deferments. Is that some some people understandably, and I get this, don't get that actually there isn't any money. And even if you do start seeing money um, it, for, from your from traditional distribution through DVDs, um, Blu-rays, you're looking at somewhere between sort of nine months and two years before the money starts to come back. And that's after everybody takes their cut. And so your sales agents are going to take their cut and the distributors are going to take their cut and then you will get whatever amount. But it will take you, on average, it seems to be a year, year and a half before you'll start seeing that money trickle back. And, of course, that, that means if you're reliant on that to invest or to pay back your investors so you can go back to them and say, will you, will you back me again, that's, that's going to put a bit of a, a, a stopgap because you can't then go and get more money to more people to invest in your film because that, that actually they might still be waiting for you to pay back that investment that they gave you for the first film. So there's a potential that, and I think this is slowing down a lot of people who, who maybe have got a second project or a third project who are having to kind of wait for money to trickle back in to be able to go out there and make another film. And it's difficult. It sounds, sounds extraordinarily difficult. Um, what, so what else did you... So you, you had this big number, yeah. um, the terrifying number and so on. What else did you, in terms of the number of independent movies that actually get distributed, you know, actually find... How many uh, movies actually find distribution, do you think? Well, I'm, I made a few notes. You'll be glad to hear. <laughs> I can't retain this amount of information. To this. No, no, no. I, I completely understand that. Yeah. Um, uh, as part of my research project, um, there was a survey between 2003 and 2011. Uh, and between that period of time, uh, 1,546 independent British films were shot. Of that 1,500... 620 had no theatrical release anywhere in the world. Of those 620, 414 of them were either shown at festivals or had a DVD or a video on demand release. So they were seen in some way, shape or form. Um, however, that leaves over 200 independently uh, produced British films over a nine year period were never seen in any format at any, whether theatrical or home, no format were they seen, or those films were never completed because the money ran out. Right. So of those 1,500, 200 have never been seen again. And it may be, as you say, just because they never got complete, and they may just be dreadful. Yeah, and well, they may be dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> Until you dr drill down and watch the 1,500, well, you can't watch 200 of them, but if you watch the other 1,300, I'm guessing some of those might be dreadful. Yeah, yeah. What I'm going to do, and I, I, I think you've got some more stuff to share with you, but I'm, I'm kind of aware that Damon has been very patiently waiting, uh, watching us and so on. Damon, hello, Damon. I'm just going to unhide you. I'm going to show you in the, broad, in the broadcast so you can actually join us. Would you like to unmute yourself, Damon? That sounds um, painful, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> <laughs> like unmute yourself, Damon. No, I'm not hello. sure. Hello, Damon. I'm that going to invite it. somebody else, and I'm going to invite um, some other people I know who, who, who said that they, I tried inviting them earlier on. Um, but I'm going to, just going to see that there may be Fortunately, there is no way for me actually to know exactly who's watching at any given moment. Um, I know people who said they will watch beforehand, and I dutifully bring up their, their lists and so on. Um, 
if Andy's still watching us and jo want to join us, I've sent Andy a... a uh, oh, incidentally, Andy did say in response to your stalking comment earlier on, he is still stalking you. Yes, um, I that. That's very nice of him. <laughs> <laughs> um, You'd only stalk by Andy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you know, I'm sure that it'll end up with me removing all my skin in one way or another, and uh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I do like the subtle picture that it's now behind your head, Damon. Yeah, I thought I thought it had to be had to put it up. There. <laughs> it's a very interesting. <laughs> So please do, uh, as I say, I've been posted a few invitations, guys, um, if you're there. And unfortunately, my comment tracker is not working this evening. So although I set this up and I've seen some posts, for some reason, it's not getting all the posts, that, uh, the comments. So I'm having to try to juggle around some, uh, aha, I've, I believe we might have, there's Andy. Cool. Hello, Andy. Oh. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Can hello. you hear us? Okay. Hello. Oh, that's much better. Yeah, that's much better. Um, we've just been talking. Thank you so much for watching. I know you've been watching this and so on. We obviously we're talking about distribution, and uh, Mark's been talking about the difficulty of distribution. Do you? Do either of you, Damon or Andy, because you guys have been making short films? so far, but obviously your your ambition, I assume, is to make feature films, is that right, in the, in the years, coming years, months, seconds, minutes? If, if, if only, uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go Damon, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I've, actually, I've actually got a couple of scripts, uh, feature scripts ready to go, some of which I've sent off to various uh, competitions and various uh, Festivals and stuff, uh, film markets. So we'll see what, if anything, comes from that. So um, yeah. So in, in it, you th you think of this as a way of approaching this, so rather than trying to get the just go out and get the funding yourself for a feature movie, you're going to take a slightly different route, which is basically through competitions. Uh, if you approach send them to producers or. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've sent them on to a few people. I'm kind of loath to say anything in case I jinx it. Um, oh yeah, no, I but, uh, completely understand. Yeah, that. I mean, yeah, we've, uh, we've we've sent some st we've we've sent some scripts out um, in a in a kind of co-production thing with a uh, a couple of guys in a similar boat on the other side of the pond. So um, right. hopefully something will come of that, um, but we shall see. Um, yeah. Uh, the competitions thing is really more about uh, kind of winning some money <laughs> more than anything else, uh, <laughs> and getting yeah, the feedback because most of the scripts, yeah. most of the script competitions, like, they basically you're paying a fee and you will get some sort of feedback on your script. Is that right? Yeah, that seems to be the way it works. Yeah. Yeah, and what about you, Damon? Have you thought about doing feature films? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm currently uh, trying to put two scripts together at the moment. Where um, we'll talk about more when we're on, but sure. we're looking at a feature of the tour. Um, and you know, it's uh, exciting, exciting news from Mark that there's a, a 15 to 20 percent chance if we make one, <laughs> no one will ever see it. <laughs> <laughs> if you finish it, if you finish it, you've got a much better chance, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can. <laughs> the moment I heard that comment, I've got always look on the bright side of life going through my head now. <laughs> <laughs> but it also means there's an 80% chance somebody will see it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And that's actually quite yeah, quite good odds. It's the same in any business, isn't it? You know, when you start off, you have you, any kind of product you are making, you've got to get it to market somehow in distribution. Um, you, we made you made a reference earlier on to um, distribution. Okay, so these are your big numbers, Mark. That you've got. It's it's tough. We all assumed it's going to be tough. Did you get any other insights into what you help think works through crowdfunding or um, what do you think made the ones that were successful successful? Oh well, there. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, what. One thing that kind of got hammered into me, actually, by Alan. Um, from Fright Fest. Um, it, what he said to me is, 
title. He said two things. He said, one, don't make a zombie movie, which I think is probably very good, very good advice for us all. Uh, oh, and Damon second, looks nervous. <laughs> 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 well, one of the scripts I'm writing might happen oh, to no, feature a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but he did say that the other thing is title. <clears throat> he said title, title, title. And as as everything's moving over to kind of uh, video on demand and, and and all these sort of systems that you get over in the states, where basically you've got a humongously long list of films. And you've got you you kind of have maybe one or two lines and a little tiny sort of poster stamp of, of the poster to make a decision on what you're going to press and what you're going to watch. Um, it will become it more and more uh, it becomes more and more important about how you title your film. Um, although he uh, he did say, well, if you start with A, it helps, <laughs> <laughs> which kind of goes back to a chorus line. Um, and so it. He did say, get the title right. If you have a title that grabs people, that's what you need to do. Because if you've just got lists and you've got very little else to kind of go on, unless you happen to be one of those films that have had a lot of publicity, a lot of marketing, no one's going to know your film from Adam. If Solitary just got put in a huge list of, like, you know, a 1,000 titles or 2,000 or 3,000, why is anyone going to click on Solitary unless they're feeling particularly lonely that night? <laughs> So, um, but but yeah, and I th I think I mean just on a slightly different tangent. Um, one of the things that I do think is important is that if as we're all kind of going into the idea of features and how you market and you distribute, we're losing all of the all of the outlets, all the high street outlets are going, and even going back, I think it's uh, the the data I looked at went back to two thousand and thirteen. At which point, 43% of all retail sales of DVDs and Blu-rays were in the supermarkets. Now that was almost 50%, and that was two years ago. Bearing in mind what's happened to HMV and all the other stores in the last three, four, five years, I would be very surprised if that that figure now isn't over 50%. But if you go into a supermarket, how how much shelf space have they got? If you look at the shelf space that's been lost just in the UK and Blockbuster and HMV and Zavi and everywhere else that kind of closed down or was reduced massively, you end up coming to the conclusion that you can't possibly get all of those titles that are released every week. Even if you do get a, a DVD, if you get a physical release, how do you get it onto the supermarket shelves? And then it becomes ever so sort of it becomes more and more important to make sure that that you, your cover, your title, and everything else is just screaming by me. And we've all been into Sainsbury's and seen, you know, the latest movie that's kind of got, I don't know, uh, not amateur toilet roll probably, but um, it's got, you know, A, another, the something evil dead, just to play on the titles that we all know. Uh, and, and unfortunately, you can only play that on the general public so many times before they go, it looks like a great cover. You know, it's got some great quotes on the front from people I've never heard of. But last time, the last two or three times I've bought films for seven or eight quid, they've not necessarily been very good. And so there is, there is an issue about how long the current system in the UK is, at least, because that's where I kind of uh, focused on with my, my stuff, how long that can continue. Because the shelf space isn't going to get any bigger. Right. And so it becomes more and more about online, more and more about VOD and the other platforms. But it's... Okay. It yeah, is sorry. A sorry to interrupt. And guys, please, Damon and, and Andy, if you anything, please just shout out. We will hear you. I, I'm curious. Is, so you made a very good point. Unless you have got a huge marketing budget, which is going to put it on billboards, it's going to put it on buses, it's going to you know TV spots or something like that. People are not going to walk into the and there's unless it's got that actually zinger title and zinger artwork on the front cover. For an independent filmmaker who doesn't have a million dollar budget to actually promote their movie, any any findings or thoughts on things that actually helped? Yeah, I mean, things out there. I, I got some. I got some really great advice from a few people. Um, um, Jessica was wonderful in her interview, and and what Jessica, I mean, you've already had her on, and what mm. she can't tell you about marketing is not worth have, knowing. Um, but it is all about marketing, and, and and 
and actually targeting the people who are interested in your product. And, and the festivals have got a bigger and bigger part to play. And, and I think, and some, some, of the, some of the feedback I, back I was starting to get was that I, it looks as though the festivals are going to start attempting to maybe look at coming up with a way that they can, they can kind of be the, um, they need to have some way of actually saying this is a good product. If you go to a festival, if you go to Fright Fest, if you go to Sitges, and this film has got in, it's gone through a sifting pro process. If you go to Sainsbury's, those films haven't been sifted. If you you need to get to a point where you've got you've got some way that that um, you've got people that you can trust who are actually going to say these are great movies, and that feels that it's a bit that's missing at the minute is you've got these you've got Netflix, but you can't really tell what's great on Netflix and what isn't. And maybe what we need is we need. Fright Fest or Celluloid Screams or, or, or you know, Grim Up North or, or whatever. Um, um, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Mark. Yeah. Grim, Grim Fest, they've already got their distribution label. Um, yeah. They've already got their own distribution label. Um, granted, some of it is uh, it's the stuff that, uh, that Simeon, who runs Grim Fest, I, they, I think they put their own stuff out on that. But I know they put out stuff like uh, some guy who kills people on that label, and they put uh, a bunch of other stuff out, I think, on uh, through the kind of grim entertainment or whatever it is banner. So I think I think maybe that's a good way to do it because although saying that, I don't know if anyone really would pay that much attention to something like that. Um, it feels that it almost needs to be kind of an online thing rather than than physical media. I yeah. don't know that they'll make an, uh, any money going forward in physical media, really, which is a shame. I think it's a very interesting thing because I think the, the automatic thing is that you look, and I was again just thinking about Netflix, I think it's really poor because the only thing that you can tell you about a new movie is they don't put up quotations, they put in a really weird tagline sentence. If you're looking for something that's really out there, you've just found it, or something like that. You've got the star rating. Um, on Netflix which runs one to four rather than one to five. But what you don't get from the festival is those lovely little wreaths around the saying, you know, Sitges Festival, you know, yeah. best film at, or things like that. And I think when you, you know, when you, and it seems to be that the trailer, that these appear mostly on the trailers, that, you know, winner of Palm Door or something like that. I mean, it is the Oscars game, if you like. Um, but you don't get that on Netflix. You don't tend to get that on IMDb. I'm just trying to think on iTunes. You don't really. You really just. It's whether or not somebody else has actually had a look about it and what and actually seen your movie, and what their rev their response is. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think curating. I think that's the word. It, it's you need. I mean, you know, I watch a huge amount of horror. But ultimately, I still I still have the same problem everyone else has. I look at three movies I've never heard of, and apart from going on IMDb, if I've never heard of them, you make a pun. And it's uh, if you go to somewhere that could, could curate, if Sitges started their own website with Netflix or something, or the Sitges Presents on, on Netflix, and they were curating like their best 50 horrors from the last 10 years, you kind of think, well, there's going to be kind of a level of quality you'll expect. But yeah. whether anyone's actually going to make I that. I think you were right, though, Mark, with the whole taking a pump thing, um, that it'll only last for so long. I mean, we, uh, we, we got a film off Netflix called The Haunting of Backwood, and there was, nothing, there was nothing called Backwood in it, and it was a sort of this weird mystery film rather than a horror film, and it was it was average at best. And then you look at what happened with the hospital. One guy wrote a piece in the in Gloucester newspaper, and all of a sudden this film was notorious across the country because it was so horrific, um, and it was actually quite terrible. Um, but <laughs> loads of people bought it on the back of a bit of notoriety. It was in the supermarkets amazingly got in there somehow, but you get a couple of experiences like that and people will then start going, well, I've tried it with a couple of films I haven't heard of, I'm going to go back to the ones which Empire are telling me to watch or which I see trailers for on the TV, you know, it's going to be all superhero movies, reboots and all that that will carry on 
um, getting the, getting the um, look-ins rather than the independents. Yeah. And then we get to a point when independent filmmakers making their first feature have got next to no chance because mm. that market's been milked dry. They'll have next to no chance of getting their movie in unless they happen to just hit that zeitgeist. You know, and yeah. if you're that paranormal activity, if you're that Blair Witch, I'm fine. But for, for the rest of us, there's going to be a real difficulty trying to get stuff in supermarkets. Not that I ever wanted to become a filmmaker to get my film in a supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> what we could all do is we could print up loads of covers and, and, and just go and put them up on the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting marketing technique. Um, okay, so we're drawing to the end of our time, and I appreciate Mark. We lost you, uh, and thank you very much indeed for Damon um, uh, for coming up for leaping in. Anything else? You, so basically, you learned um, make sure that your your film title is Acme Horror. That seems to get get you to the top of the, the very top of the list, basically. Um, yeah, I'm grooving that one, guys. You can't have it. <laughs> I knew I should have got. I knew I should have got that Facebook page up before I started this interview. Um, <laughs> but, and what do you, do you think about social media? I mean, is it Facebook? Is it Twitter? Is it uh, Snapchat or Instagram? I, I kind of think it's everything. I mean, I, I, I I'm. I hate. I don't hate social media. I, I think it's a great thing. But to have to do it, which I'm kind of having to force myself to go, you need to make more of an effort, Mark. You're not doing it as often as you should. But to build up interest in what you're doing, I think it's going to become more and more important because ultimately we get, we are more responsible as filmmakers for our own audience. If, if I want to have an audience, it's my responsibility to make sure, whether by going to festivals, submitting to festivals, whether you know um, publicising it to death online, whether through whatever I do, that I'm trying my best to build up an audience and actually give value to an audience. Because I think if you're just going to go, here's my film, watch my trailer, which admittedly that's what I'm doing at the moment. But <laughs> if, that's all, if that's all you're going to do, then people are soon going to go, well, yeah, great, Mark, you've done the trailer, congratulations. Um, and if you're just going to say, oh, I'm doing, I'm doing a crowdfunding campaign, give me some money, it's about trying to give stuff back and... and Trying to get into that mindset and, and think, what can I offer people? Not an awful lot, as you've probably seen. But, <laughs> but actually, that Stop is a it. Stop being English. Stop <laughs> being American. <laughs> yeah, but I think it, I do think as time goes on, it will become more and more, more important for us as independent filmmakers who are trying to actually, you know, carve a niche to actually build up. And I think you do that through through creation of of quality product. I think. I mean, you know, I'm not here to kind of butter anyone up, but I think what Andy's done is he's created a niche, uh, and Andy's created a, 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 an amount of films where I'm going, God, I can't wait to see his next film. I'm probably going to sit there with a bucket, but I can't wait to see <laughs> No, you wouldn't, man. I've totally stepped, I've stepped totally away from that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I think by, by, nice by, doing, by doing two or three films in, in, in a certain manner, I think you create... You do create that kind of identity, and ultimately, we we all kind of buy into that. Whether it's Hitchcock, or whether or not you know we're we're fans of um, Christopher Nolan or any filmmaker, that there's an idea that you build up your kind of your identity and the identity of what you make. And I think over a period of time, if you continue to come out with quality products, even if you if you move from genre to genre, if you come out and you have a style. And you're actually giving something that no one else is giving. I think that you'll find an audience, and that's what I hope and pray that I'm I'm going to be able to do as a filmmaker. Now that's interesting, and I will bring Andy in on this, and and I'll come to you as well, then before I start shutting this down, because I think it's a very interesting. You've made a very good point, Andy, that you've done three body horror, if you like, but your next one is not. How was that terrifying? That decision. Um, t slightly. Uh, there's an expectation, uh, and I, I think uh, certainly my Mark and Damon's level, um, we're, we're all kind of working on the same level. That expectation is is terrifying in and of itself, but there's something kind of um, liberating at the same time about taking the decision, even in my case, briefly, 
to step away from body horror and just do something different before eventually returning to body horror. Right. Uh, I think it is it's, it's a liberating thing to do that, but it's absolutely terrifying um, be, because there is this expectation um, for the kind of thing that I do. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see how we'll see how it pans out. Well, yeah, I, and and to be honest, I can just I just have to point to Nightbreed and Clive's experience on Nightbreed. That you know the night the the movie Nightbreed was never written to be another Hellraiser, but the studio assumed that because they'd seen Hellraiser, and the success of Hellraiser, that's what they were going to get. Um, that was not good experience for him. What about yourself, Damon? How do you see? What do you think about that? Are you? And I will just say that Mark had clearly stated, you know, you can move from genre to genre, but as long as you've established the style or Je ne sais quoi. But what do you think, Damon? Do you, you think this is the sort of movie that I will always want to make? or For me, your... personally, I've, there's, so growing up with horror, there's so many different films that I've loved. That, um, I feel that each one I do, I want to try and do something different um, rather than... Uh, in falling into in doing something where, you know, I mean, there, there are certain types of horrors that I particularly love, um, but I'll always wonder if, oh, what if I've done that and I've done that? And, um, you know, as, as horrible as it may be to, sa to say, I don't always just want to do horror films either. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a kind of... Uh, I want to make sure that um, in terms of being able to make films that I can do, um, rep you know, it's that I've grown up and loved that I can actually do that myself. Um, so, so you know, I'm hoping that everything I do will be be very different. Um, and I think what with Andy, what he does is probably harder because he's you know some, somebody like Cronenberg who does a very particular type of horror film but manages to still keep an audience doing that. Um, I think it's commendable that you can stick in a certain area and manage to make each one different and interesting mm. and watchable and for people to still want to see your next one yeah. and partly for me that might be something where I where I don't want to do that because I'm worried that if I do people get bored of me and I it's perhaps a little bit of lack of faith in myself to, to do that so that's, yeah. that's been my concern as well that was why I kind of made the decision to because uh, I'd had a couple of rumblings that I was doing the same thing uh, it was maybe more of the same so even briefly, that's why the decision was made to change things up. Yeah, but you've still oh, managed to do, to do three, and people want to see your fourth. So, you know, it's that's that's no no mean mean, mean thing to do. No it was interesting as well. I think it's very different for film. I think I think the fear and this thing of wanting I, again, I just immediately think about Clive. You know, it was a long time. I was saying, I'm not just a horror filmmaker. I'm not just a horror writer. I'm, you know, when he, when Weave World came out, I remember him being on John and I was saying, this is not a horror book, this is a fantasy book. Um, he re describes himself as an imagineer rather than as a... What I also find interesting, in, if you think of book writing, and Stephen King, I've got the name right, Richard Bachman books. Yeah. Yeah. People will write, and this is something that, and J.K. Rowling did it recently as well, um, kind of before she came out of the closet and said, oh yeah, actually I wrote this book as well. Um, which helps us sell enormously, I'm sure. But there is this kind of understanding that if you become known for a particular thing, then you are you can be trapped within that in your perception. And it's hard. As a writer, you just change your name. Nobody knows who it is. You cannot do that as a filmmaker. You do not have that opportunity. So I think it is it is interesting. But the bottom line, I think, is as you all say, if you're doing good quality product, if you're telling a decent story and you're doing it well people will want to come to see it. Mm. Gentlemen, uh, this is... Sorry, sorry. I, I was just going to... Sorry, just final thing. I was sure. just going to say, I think it's important to make the most, and that's what I'm trying to do with doing shorts, make the most of the opportunity to experiment more, because I think the, the Clive thing knocks on the head. Hellraiser, mm. not for his fans, and not for horror fans, who kind of go, no, we, we get that Clive does a huge amount of stuff, he's doing his art, you know, there's there's an eroticism to what he does, it's not just horror movies. Mm -hmm. But Hellraiser was big, and if you say Clive Barker to anyone now, it's, oh, Hellraiser, oh, this is a horror guy. And actually there is a thing that once you get into features, 
if you have a hit uh, as, as a feature filmmaker, that's kind of what people will call you. You will be the horror guy, you'll be the comedy guy. And I think as a filmmaker doing shorts, you, we're kind of, for 99% of the population, we're all under the radar. You know, um, I, I think very few shorts will ever come into the public consciousness, you know, until we get another red balloon or anything. It's, it's not likely to happen. And so we get to experiment. And I think that's why it's really important for us to try and do stuff. And I think, you know, Damon's doing what um, Andy's doing and what I'm doing between Solitary and the next film, completely different subjects to completely different themes. And I, I'm going to take the, the most of that because once you make that first film, if it's a hit, they'll call you the horror guy. If it's not a hit, they'll call you the shit horror guy. I apologise for the language. <laughs> Rather than the shit hot guy. Don't be the shit horror guy. <laughs> <laughs> Coprophilia. Now there's a yes. Okay, fine. Stop <laughs> going there, Nick. Right. Okay, <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I don't know. You can't end the note. It's just be done. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Stop it, Nick. Just stop it. <laughs> Gentlemen, um, I actually have to wind this down because I've got to go and get my husband from um, the airport at some point tonight. He's flying back in from Rome. Um, thank you so very much indeed to Mark Logan, to um, Andy Stewart, and to Damon Rickard. This was not the show that I'd originally thought we were going to do tonight. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just thought I'd give in early on, and then I thought, no, I'll, I'll leave it 20 minutes and come back in. <laughs> oh, well. I thought, oh, no. I'll just leave that in the door. He's better than I am. And, and Mark, I, I was so prepared I hadn't even done my hair. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't prepared. That was like, that's the, the great thing with me. The, the man with pinhead behind his head. I wasn't prepared. I didn't think I'd be. No, that that came when 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 Nick said I'll put it back. I went and that go get the picture. <laughs> I saw it surreptitiously being placed behind. <laughs> but what the hell is he doing there? Awesome. Next time I'll get someone to come and put a picture behind me to. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so very much indeed. I think this has been wonderful. There's some really rare insights and very useful insights into distribution and what it's like and what you know it's like. Um, I look forward to speaking to, to um, Andy on the 24th. Um, Yay! Along with... <laughs> Sorry, <David. laughs> yeah, Andy. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and please, you're more than welcome to come and join us, guys. And just give him a hard time, basically. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Chattering with Nicholas Events. I've been chattering with Damon Rickard and Andy Stewart and Mark Logan. And I will see you uh, next week when we will be talking about original versus remake of The Evil Dead. Good night, and thank you very much indeed. Good night. Say good night, guys. Good night. Good night. I'm stopping the broadcast now.